Thanks. Indeed. Well, look, let's go back to Archbishop uh, Canterbury and let's have a little listen before we go to uh, a guest on this uh, about what to what the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Wilby, actually had to say on the floor of the House of Lords Chamber yesterday. Let's uh, listen to that. We need a bill to stop the boats. We need a bill to destroy the evil tribe of traffickers. The tragedy is that without much change, this is not that bill. It is morally unacceptable and politically impractical to let the poorest countries deal with the crisis alone. My Lords, this bill is an attempt at a short-term fix. It risks great damage to the UK's interests and reputation at home and abroad, let alone the interests of those in need of protection or the nations who together face this challenge. A short-term fix, he says. I think a lot of us would be very happy to have a short-term fix, any kind of fix at all. Well, let's talk about this with George Pitcher. He's a, a Church of England priest and a former advisor to a former Archbishop of Canterbury. That was Rowan Williams. Good morning to you. Good morning, Julia. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, is uh, the Archbishop right to say that this is a morally unacceptable and politically impractical policy? Well, I happen to share his opinion, but of course he's got... Um... Uh, of course, he's got a right to express uh, that view. In fact, he has a duty to express that view as a as a as a Christian and a very public figure. Christian, um, it's his job to stand in the corner of the dispossessed and the marginalised and those without power and those who are most vulnerable. Um, but it's also, at a more practical level, his duty to speak out as a parliamentarian. He's a member of the House of Lords, and um, so I can't really understand what the well, shock or surprise well, is that I mean, a there are, speaks out on this issue. There are places in the House of Lords, obviously four bishops, uh, and I mean, some people are getting in touch saying you know, they don't think that should be the case. But I think, yeah, that's by the by. The current thing, the issue here is you've got somebody who is in a sort of an apolitical role to a certain extent. You know, he's the man who placed the crown on the... the King Charles's head on Saturday in the coronation, and this whole constitutional monarchy you know, above, uh, you know, above the political fray, uh, and now speaking out on what is a very politically contentious issue, he's a lot of people would say, look, he just constantly comes out with his viewpoints, and they're nearly always a lot of people would say Tory bashing. He doesn't mention the government, you know, specifically, but that he's coming with a political point. When his he the the uh, I suppose the the respect and the attention he gets for for his job is is kind of why you know he's, he's able to be you know he's on the front pages of newspapers today. So when he speaks out, he speaks out with the power of that position as Archbishop of Canterbury, and yet he's making a party political point, isn't he? Should he be doing that? Well, I yeah, um, Paul, where do you begin, Julia? I mean, I think I. Uh... I, I think it's it's amusing uh, and sometimes mildly irritating uh, that um, commentators say that uh, that that clerics, bishops, uh, priests like me should butt out of politics and get back in your pulpit and uh, don't tell us what to do and so on. Um, the Christian faith is profoundly political in as much as it's founded on the basis of somebody who rode into the belly of the powerful beast in Jerusalem to take on the Roman and Jewish authorities of the day, and it cost him his life for doing so. It's a, I, I repeat that it's a duty for Christians to speak out for and to speak truth to power, to speak Christian truth to power. You say that he should be apolitical. Well, I mean, you know, as soon as you express an opinion, you you can uh, you can find yourself in a, a political position or being critical of one side or the other. You allude a moment ago to him always appearing to be Tory bashing. Well, I'm not sure that's entirely true. I mean, you know, we're talking about. Uh, a highly privileged old Etonian who, um, who in the past has defended, I think, uh, uh, Prince Andrew, and uh, he's defended um, uh, Boris Johnson in some circumstances. So, I mean, you know, I think he's entitled to express his opinion as he sees it. Um, it's always the objection always comes when it's an, when it's opinion that uh, the politicians and particularly red-faced Tory backbenchers um, find disagreeable. Yeah. And uh, that's when they sort of... It's interesting in that context, Julia, that very often 
when there's an issue about family values or abortion policy or something, you'll hear the very same people going, where are the bishops on yeah. this matter? Okay, so people, oh, people want to it both ways. I, I, understand, I understand your point about, you know, uh, the, the, the duty of, of someone of Christian faith, and particularly in his position, to speak out on issues that he considers to be big moral issues. A lot of our, our audience are getting in touch today saying, well, OK, What's your plan then? You know, if you support what he has to say, we're told that it's, it's morally unacceptable, it's impractical, you can't leave, you know, not only you know, he talked about the reputation of this country abroad and you, you can't leave uh, poorer countries around the world to deal with this and have to take all the refugees. We've got a duty of care to these people. And like, well, a lot of people in this country will say, well, A, what about duty of care to people here who already can't, you know, find housing and services and paying high taxes and, and the like. But, but... What is his solution then? How many of these people do we take? Well, <clears throat> the, the first thing to say is that I don't know what his solution is, Julia, because I don't work for the Archbishop of Canterbury anymore. But, but, but you support what that, he says. What was your solution? Within that, clip, within that clip that you played, he was saying that what we have is a, a collective responsibility to address the problem at source. The migration problem that we, is growing in this century is an enormous one, and the southern cone if you like the southern hemisphere is going increasingly to be migrating north to more prosperous economies and so on and that's a problem uh, that we should collectively address i mean julia if only there was some sort of pan-european group or federation that could uh, organize this uh, themselves can i just say um the eu isn't very um, no, but george george this is hilarious because the eu are in battling about this the east and the western european nations in battle already italy in battle with france and and with germany Making about very this. many more than we are yeah. well, well no but not through choice i mean georgia maloney isn't taking them through choice she's you know she, they haven't got any choice people are arriving on those boats i mean but this is the thing you say we need to have a take collective well, they're, they're with it very much better they're, they're trying to ship them out the main thing is there's there's such high joblessness in uh, in italy they're not staying in italy so well, that's the only at, thing that works look at what france and germany are doing but the point has here it, have, Julia, you, been, have point... you been have you been to paris lately and seen the people sleeping on the streets yeah well, well you know look at the, look at london by comparison as well of course it's but it's a very difficult problem but it's one that we have to but it's the idea it's this ridiculous idea that with regard if, to those if, countries that they come but from. george it's this idea that oh the eu's dealing with it so much better they're really not i mean and if you're talking about people taking action i think the action is going to be that everyone's going to say let's just build a wall you say we need to take collective responsibility to address that source the problem is lots of countries are poorer um, and, and, and there are countries that are war-torn or facing, you know, civil civil strife and the like, and people want to go somewhere they've got better prospects. Those are precisely well, the issues well, yes. we should be addressing. Well, Julia. exactly. Well, when you say we should address them, the very same arguments were used, like, you know, we mustn't get involved in the Syrian war. It's not our problem. We shouldn't get involved in it. It's a moral argument. We shouldn't be taking sides and, and lead us to it. And then you have a massive problem with people being displaced from Syria. Uh, and then, then what do we do? People don't want to get involved in the Ukraine war. Well, then you have all the Ukrainian women and children having to leave the country for safety because of the Russian invasion. The reality is we're not going to solve every war and we're not going to suddenly make the developing world much, much richer so people want to stay there. So there are going to be tens, even hundreds of millions of people who are going to want to move to countries in Europe to live with us. How many of them do we take? Well, it's lovely to have you on my show, Julia, and to, uh, to, to hear your opinion. How did you answer the question? Um, How many are we going to take? Well, listen, we take... The, the ones in the small boats are a small drop in the ocean, if that's not a, yeah. uh, a, a, a rather vulgar way of putting it. Um, the, there, are, there are literally millions that arrive legally on aeroplanes and so on, except we are more concerned with making dog whistle uh, demonization uh, uh, issues out of the ones that are arriving on well, boats. Demon, we're demonizing about, people who pay thousands of pounds to people traffickers who arrive illegally. Can you answer my Sorry? question, George? Can you answer my question? What's how your many? Question? How many are we going to take? Hundreds of millions of people who want to leave their countries in the developing world and they want to come and live here. How many are we going to take? Give me a number. Well, no, I'm not going to give you a number. What I'm going to say is that I think the Archbishop of Canterbury is saying that what we would what what would be a far better mechanism rather than making knee-jerk isolationist moves like 
like, uh, like uh, we're going to defeat the small boats, is to have a decent system of processing, a cooperative arrangement with other countries for doing so, a cooperative arrangement with other countries for addressing the migration issues at source, rather than simply going, okay. we're an island off the off the uh, northwest of Europe and we're going to have nothing to do with right. it. Right, okay, George. Government solution. I asked you and a question. It's the government I'll... that is cutting international aid. Okay, uh, George, I asked you a question. And I, I asked this question of everyone who says they don't like this policy. I think there are plenty of things you can criticise about this migration law. The Rwanda policy, you can, there's plenty to criticise. But every time someone criticises it, I always say, what's your solution? We should work better, collective responsibility, like... At the end of the day, we're either going to take a load of these people or we're not. We're not going to solve the world's crises in, in, in any... Ever, frankly, ever. There will always be richer and poorer countries. So, at the end of the day, you've got hundreds of millions of people who want to come to Europe. Many of them will want to come to the UK. How many do we take? You can talk about we can work as a collective, we can all be nice, we can have lots of meetings. At the end of the day, how many are we going to take? That's what you've got to answer. Okay. You can satirise being collective and um, and and, uh, and suggest that that's a sort of namby pamby, no, uh, snowflake liberal thing to be. How many Julia, we're going but to take? It's sensible. I don't know how many. No, but we're you've going got to, okay. I'm, going, I'm not to the last we person. Don't know George, how many there are? We do. Julia. We know. We know that there are going to be at least tens of millions and probably hundreds of millions. No, that's how just a ridiculous swine of rather than frightening tack. It's just Swain Brahman saying there are there are a billion people on the move or something that may want to come to the UK. That's another means of simply putting putting the frighteners on the situation. Right. You've got let's say let's say there's only five hundred thousand like uh, like like like, um, uh, like Justin Welby saying, look, surely we should get a grasp of what the situation consists of and address it. As a, okay, and address it. As, as, you as can have meetings nations, and you can make speeches. At the end of the day, you've got a load of people from poor and or war-torn countries who want to come and live in Europe, including in the UK. How many are we going to take? Do we take 10,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million? You know, back in 2015, Germany opened their doors. They had a couple of million yeah. people turn up. It's not worked out very well for them. Sweden, Denmark, the same. Not worked out very well for them. They are regretting those decisions. How many are we going to no, take? No, I don't think I'm not like what, I don't know what evidence you have for them uh, regretting that. Those, those, those I think you'll find that the, the support for parties who've opposed that will that has risen exponentially will tell you exactly how much that's been regretted. Well, that's because that's something you want to hear. I mean, you know, the point here, surely, Julia, is unless we address the situation at source, of course we're individually going to, as countries, going to have to keep dealing with it in our own ways. And you say, you say that it's not good enough simply not to name a number as to how many we're willing to take. But I tell you that it's not good enough simply to say, oh, we'll send them to Rwanda. I mean, for goodness sake, if that's the best we can come up with, then we um, then we really do need to think again, and we need to think again. Well, if we can't send them home, the if we can't send them home, and the British people don't want them here, where do send we send them? Send them home, Julia. Many of these people are refugees from well, exactly. war-torn If we uh, can't countries. send them home, and the British people yeah. don't want them here, where do we send them? Well, we have to find ways of accommodating them as a European continent. So we, so we send them, we send them to France, back to France. We send them to. They no, don't, don't, they don't want them, them either. We, are, we are, I mean, well, how many, how many so far is it this year or something? Sixty-five thousand. Well, you know, when, year. when, when, um, uh, when Boris Johnson kept India off the red zone list during ahead of the COVID lockdown, so that he could have a photo opportunity in India, striking a trade deal. But George, he was this is totally a million and a half people flew in from India. A million and a half. You know who? Flew in and most of, India, by the way, Julia. most of those people were people were British people who lived here and were trying to get back to their home country. That's not that. You don't have a statistical. I remember. I remember covering this at the there time. Actually, and they were, they were they were they were largely they British were, passport holders because they were entering the country legally. No, but they were know, British just, people uh, coming home. You're, you're, all you want, all you want to say is we don't want these small boats. I mean, what's what? Would you subscribe to Pretty Patel's policy of a wave machine in the channel? No, I always thought that I mean, was stupid yeah. and talked about that at the time. But but that's well, that, that's every the point solution is solution this government comes up with. Julia is stupid. But but what's your what's your solution? And your solution is oh we should all talk and 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 come up with a collective solution. 
But you haven't. You, but every time I ask this question, everyone who criticises government policy never actually gives anything that is not pie in the sky. I mean, let's all go and sing Kumbaya so in North Africa the and the it's Middle East, and everything the will be fine. For the United Nations to address. <laughs> migration issues at source. It's not what do you mean address it at source? So I, did no cut. one think of resolving every war? That's crazy of us. Why didn't we do that? Did no one think of actually trying to make the world a richer place? Well, they've been trying no, to do no, that no, as no, well. No, 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 no. I mean, you know, the the solving every war. You you you. you well, that's you, addressing you it to source. Exaggerate everything to it to the extreme to try to support a point for sending people to Rwanda. Right. I mean, the 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 the, the issue here is that there are fundamentally serious issues of migration that relate to places yep. like Syria, that, replate, that, that relate to places like Afghanistan, by the way, very much the cause and fault of Western intervention there. <laughs> So, you know, we No, they're not fleeing the Taliban, absolutely not. I'm going to ask you just one final question, just suggested by one of my audience. I, 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 you won't answer the question, how many should we as a nation take? Will you answer the question, if oh, you want to have... 100,000. 100,000? You want to take 100,000? Right, OK. Well, you know, and when 200,000 well, you know, turn up, up, what are you going to do with the other 100? Because you're, for, you're, you're making up numbers, Julia. <laughs> I'm not making up numbers at all. George, final question. Uh, very quickly, one answer if you can. How many people will you take have a living in your home? How many? How many? What? How many? How many, how many people will want to come to this country? Will you take to live in your home? Well, I have three Ukrainians in it at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that probably takes us pretty much to capacity. How many have you got, Julia? Oh, none. I live in a flat. I haven't got any spare space for anybody. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, there you are. I don't know what that really is. I don't. I, I genuinely, yeah. genuinely, there is nowhere for anyone to sleep in my home apart from my family, which is why I haven't got Ukrainians living in my home. But I mean, you can sneer at that. Well, but well, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry I've, I don't I've live got, a big I've house which has got spare rooms for uh, another family. What exactly does that prove? Oh. I don't. I, I just find sneering at somebody for saying I don't have room for a Ukrainian family because I live in a flat. I think. I think it's a bit weird to sneer at someone telling you the reason why they yeah, don't. I mean, I'm, well, I'm, not, I'm, not attack, I'm not attacking you for that. I'm just giving you, you asked me for numbers and I've given you a number. No, you get, fair enough. My house. Right, we're going to have to leave it, but only because we're way over time. George, I very much hope you come on again. George Pitcher is a, a Church of England priest and a former advisor to a previous Archbishop of Canterbury.